258 kilometers and at the end of the day a French world champion welcome to wheel suckers what's up guys black calls here and welcome back to yet another episode of my brand new podcast wheel sucker and today we're going to discuss the world championship road race but I do have a guest on my channel yes lads uh, alongside me is uh, Joe also known as Tim Soski I'll let you introduce yourself for those who, who have not any idea of who you are hi guys i'm joe aka tim zoski i do pro cycling manager videos on youtube i also have a podcast called the tim zoski podcast about cycling um and yeah that's pretty much it that's all you need to know about me it, it is it, it really is he's, he's not that interesting very, <laughs> very uninteresting i'm afraid i'm kidding i'm kidding and for those uh who want to take a listen uh i was actually on his podcast two or three days ago depending on when uh, this actually gets out uh, to preview the race so that you can listen to that and see how wrong uh, we potentially were when it came to, uh, to our predictions um, but this podcast is going to follow a simple simple uh, plan we're going to take a look at the race uh, do a quick recap and then analyze um, what happened and yeah just go back on our predictions all right so uh, in the breakaway today uh, we had seven riders i believe um now we all know that the breakaway rarely does anything um on, on the world championships uh i mean i i think i can't remember of a breakaway that actually had any impact uh, or at least an early breakaway that had an impact on the on the race but we had uh seven different riders as i said we had jonas Kor, uh torstein i'm gonna go i guess and say train i don't know i'm not from norway please do not attack me if i pronounce that co incorrectly uh, Yuki Arashiro, uh, Ulises Castillo, Daniel Fominic, Eduard Michael Grossu, and Marco Friedrich. They lasted around 150 kilometers, I think, maybe a bit more. Um, but I think we all knew that the race would potentially play in like the final 80 kilometers. Uh, I think you'd agree with me on, on that, Joe. Oh, definitely. I, I think everyone, even the guys up the road, knew it was unlikely they would really uh, have a have an impact in the final. Yeah. I mean, again, like it, it was a tough course, tougher than I anticipated and than I expected. Uh, I think that's probably why some of our predictions might have been a bit off. Uh, but again, we'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. Um, but there was one key thing uh, during the first 180 kilometers, um, but with two teams maintaining the pace in the peloton, Belgium and France. Belgium obviously pacing for Wout van Aert, actually organized around a leader for once, which was a, a change uh, compared to the previous years. And I think it kind of helped Belgium uh, in the race and also France obviously pacing for Julien Philippe. Uh, France with a dedicated team around the, the leader of the Conan Quickstep. And um, I mean, it went quite quickly. Nothing really happened um, and then when we entered the final 60, 70 kilometers, we had one incident, uh, which I think was Tadej Pogacar. I don't know if he had a puncture, but I know he changed his bike. Um, and and then we saw Luca Mesgec pacing a lot during the Mazzolano to launch an attack from Tadej Pogacar uh, with 45 kilometers to go. And I did not anticipate that at all. I didn't think Tadej would attack this early. Uh, and if he did, I was maybe expecting him to get uh, some support, but he didn't. Um, and Belgium paced, uh, chased him down, France chased him down. Uh, I think Tij Benoot and Guillaume Martin were the main two guys. And to be fair to Tadej, he did very well. He, he held on, I think, 20, 25 kilometers on his own, something along those lines, uh, with a peloton going full speed ahead. Uh, trying to catch him uh, and he held on until an attack from Tom Dumoulin in uh, the final lap of the race France decided to bring everyone back with Guillaume Martin amazing work by the way by the leader of Cofidis just I mean incredible ride genuinely an incredible ride from him um, and it was a somewhat bunched peloton that arrived at the bottom of the uh, Chima Galisterna um, I think around, I don't know, f maybe 40, 50 elements, something along those lines. Um, I can't remember who attacked first. I think I think it was Vincenzo Nibali who made the first move. Uh, no, actually it was Caruso. Yeah, it was Damiano Caruso who made the first move. Uh, Von Aert tried to chase him down. Von Aert then chased Vincenzo Nibali. Uh, there was a lot of attacks around the, uh, the squalor. 
everyone being uh, quite careful because we all know how good he is uh, when it comes to uh, to downhill portions. And um, and then there was ten riders, everyone kind of looking at each other in the um, in the Chima Galistera now in the final slopes. Okay. And then Julien happened. Julien happened, and I I I I don't know how he pulled it off, but he's done an incredible attack, immediately getting a gap. Uh, Jakob Fulsang and Kwiatkowski, I think, were the ones trying to chase him down. But Julien opened the gap of about 10 seconds at the summit of the Galisterna. And uh, we had, so, Kwiatkowski, Fulsang, Hershey, Roglic, Van Aert. Uh, am I missing someone? Fulsang? Have I said Fulsang? Who am I missing? Hold up. Kwiatkowski, Fulsang, Hershey, Van Aert, Roglic. Yeah, that's it. I think that was it, yeah. Um, and they've never been able to catch Julien. And for the first time in 23 years, the French champion, or well, the world champion, is actually French, which is a nice change for once. We've actually won a race. Woohoo! <laughs> and um, compared to our Tour de France, which was somewhat sad, uh, it's, it's good to see France winning. What did you make of the race, Joe? I mean, it was... Uh, a slow burner, I think, with the breakaway going away, as it often is with the super long races at the World Championships. But um, it really exploded into life, obviously, with Pogacar's attack. And it was a brave move. I think he needed someone to go alongside him, to be honest. It was, yeah, it was a bit too far for him to go solo. I think it was over 40k out with a few climbs still to go. Um, and yeah, obviously, he really had no chance after he was caught. But... Ala Philippe's attack was was just unbelievable. I mean, it looked like everyone was at their limit, and for him to produce that acceleration on the final climb, I thought it it was pretty special. To be fair, yeah, I'll have to agree that that move. Um, I mean, we all know the uh, the, the punching qualities uh, that Julien has uh, as a puncher, right? Obviously, um, but he really stepped up his game, and compared to the formula he showed on the Tour de France, sure he won in Nice. Uh, but that that was that was something else, and I'm pretty sure I said in my prediction that if Julien wanted to get a result, he'd have not only to be strong but to be smart, uh, which is not something he had shown actually on the Tour de France. Uh, I think he was quite smart uh, in in today's race. Uh, I mean, Guillaume Martin just working uh, like a mad lad for him. Quentin Paché and Nance Peters as well doing a lot of work um, in that midway portion of the race. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, their their work has gone for I mean unnoticed because they're not there uh, on the um, in the final classification, uh, but they're a big part as to why Julien I believe has won, uh, and we haven't even I haven't even said the podium, but Alaphilippe wins ahead of Wout van Aert and Mark Hirschi, uh, Kwiatkowski, Fulsang, and Roglic round up the first group with Michael Matthews, Alejandro Valverde, Schachmann, and Caruso to complete the top ten. Um, I think we're going to go a bit deeper now into the race. Uh, I feel like we don't really need to talk about the first 200 kilometers. Um, I'm going to go back on that move from Tadej Pogacar. Do you feel like it was an attack for himself or a move to either push the teams like Belgium and France to lose riders around their leaders or just to set up someone like Primoz Roglic? I mean, there was, there was two ways they could have played it, I feel. Uh, Slovenia, they had obviously Pogacar and Roglic and they needed it to be a high tempo for one of those guys to win on the climbs. Um, or they could have played a, uh, a bit more conservatively and ridden for Luka Mezgec, which obviously they didn't do in the end. Um, and having Pogacar and Roglic, I guess means you can use one up and you know uh, try and send one up the road, see what he can do. If he wins, great. If he's bought in, then the other technically should uh, have just sat in the wheels and maybe feel a bit fresher. And it, it proves to be the case because Roglic, he was there in the final, just obviously didn't quite have the acceleration to follow Alaphilippe. But Roglic was right there, which um, it did surprise me a little bit because he did fade a little bit towards the end of the tour, as we know all too well. Uh, but yeah, it was good to see Roglic right up there. It was actually surprising. I, I expected to see the other. I expected to see Roglic up the road to seize up a move for Tade. I didn't expect to see Tade making the move for Roglic. Um, and one of the things as well, you, you mentioned Luka Mezgic. Uh, for those who've watched the uh, preview podcast, 
Luka Mesgec was actually on my podium. Um, but first of all, I, I fully underestimated the course. It was much, much tougher <laughs> than, than I thought, like genuinely. Uh, it, 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 it took me by surprise. Um, but also, I, I feel like the if you hadn't ridden quite hard and tried to put a high tempo, you were basically setting yourself up to sprint against Wout Van Aert. No matter who you were, Wout Van Aert would have made it. And even with that high of a rhythm, Wout Van Aert managed to finish in the what second group or first group, as you want to call it. So I, I feel like it was the smart move from Slovenia to attack. Primoz didn't have the legs to follow Julian, but no one did. Um, then he got absolutely battered in the sprint. But I mean, I think Slovenia played well. Um, I don't think any of, I mean, we, we I, I don't think anyone had them as winners. Um, but they, they've showed their colors. Um, and actually, speaking of colors, we're going to move slightly from the analysis. But we have to talk about the kids. At least I do. <laughs> I mean, can we have some change? Because Belgium, Colombia, Australia, right? If your TV hasn't doesn't have bright colors, I was watching on my phone, right? And my, my phone is not bad, but it's not like 4K, Ultra HD, all of that. I cannot distinguish. Is that a word? I think it is. That's I cannot distinguish the kits. Colombia and Belgium are the same, right? Australia, if if you've got non, uh, if you've got like cold colors, same kit. Uh, France, USA, Italy, it's the same kids. Please change. I don't know. Have something that resembles your flag. Italy, I know like your La Squadra Azzurra, you were blue. Your flag is green and red and white. Please have a kid that resembles it. It would make my life so much easier. Because at one point I was like, oh, it's like from someone from the USA. No, it was Damiano Caruso. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the USA kit, it doesn't really resemble their flag at all, uh, oh, if I'm not mistaken. Shocking, shocking. Uh, but Caruso actually leading Italy. That's a nice transition. But Caruso leading Italy in the classification in 10th place. Uh, we had talked in the uh, preview about their chances, and we mentioned Ulisi, we mentioned Bugioli, we had somewhat mentioned Nibali. We haven't really talked about them in a Caruso. We didn't, we didn't. And... He he was fantastic at the tour, wasn't he? I think he got top ten in the end um, on the final TT, yeah, finishing in tenth. And he was uh, it was the stage Lopez one where he was on the front, literally with the final GC guys. And uh, yeah, he was so impressive in the mountains at the tour and a different course today. He is in fantastic form, it has to be said. Yeah, uh, he was uh, setting uh, Michelanda on the Col de la Luz yeah. when Michelanda crumbled. Uh, but yeah, if there was someone from Italy to be in the top 10, I probably wouldn't have put my money on Caruso at the start, although it looked like a smart pick because he was the rider in form. Uh, I have no idea where Diego Lisi finished, but I think it's outside of the top five. Oh, it's actually 47th. So yeah, uh, an interesting one for, uh, for Diego. I thought he had the legs to, to go a bit, uh, a bit better than this. But when you take a look at the top 10, it's a very, very competitive top 10. There's not a rider there that doesn't deserve a spot. There, there's not, I mean, I talked about having always that rider that is in the top 10 and you didn't expect it. Hmm. There's none really that year. Uh, Valverde in eighth, you have to mention, the lad is 40 years old. Yeah. He's 40 years old. And he's, he's done this. I mean, massive, massive shout out to, to Valverde. I didn't see much of Spain in the race, but they've got three riders in the top 20. I saw, no, Mikel Landa tried to attack at one point. Yeah, I think he attacked um, on the, uh, was it penultimate climb? I think it was. I think he was trying to set up a move when, uh, well, I th actually, I think he followed uh, Vincenzo Nibali when the two of them attacked. And Landa finishes with Nibali just behind uh, the, the G2 group of Michael Matthews. Um, speaking of Michael Matthews, I don't think he could have done any better today. He, he rode brilliantly and it was going to be difficult for him. He had, I think, Richie Port there until the final climb. Port had a good race as well. Um, but Matthews, if he if he was in that final group, I think he'd have uh, he'd have taken it if he managed to stay with the front guys. Uh, he showed in the sprint against Valverde Shackman. Uh, he he's a level above in the sprints compared to those guys. He he just just didn't quite have it to stay over the, over the hills, and um, it was a shame for Matthews. I thought he'd do really well, and he did have a great race. Um, just so close for him. 
I mean, like, yeah, we, we both had him on the podium, um, but f for him to be seventh ahead of some riders like Schachmann, Valverde, Nibali, Tom Dumoulin, it's still a big achievement. It really is. Uh, and had the, the race been a bit easier, he most likely would have been up there uh, with Wout van Aert fighting for that podium, uh, potentially getting third, which would have been uh, good for, for our predictions. <laughs> uh but yeah is there anything else you you wish to talk about uh in the, the post race analysis so yeah we mentioned ala philippe riding a smart race which he he certainly did and also the pagatra attack and uh, you know we said that was a decent move for slovenia i i wonder if he could have left it until the following lap to make that attack because it, it was a big move and i think the peloton even knowing it was Tali Pogaccio who's just won the Tour de France, they they thought it would be a big ask for him to go solo from that far out. And if he'd left it until the final Mazzolano climb, uh, where I think we saw the attacks of Iran and Landa, uh, it, it maybe would have been more difficult to go clear, but I, I think that could have worked better for them. I think that's a, a slight change in tactics I would have played if I was Slovenia. And if Pogaccio wasn't able to go off the front on that climb, then potentially he could have played a bigger role in the final as well yeah yeah i agree and also if i mean we it's it's a game of if obviously we, we don't know what would have happened but had pogata not attacked in the penultimate lap uh some riders such as luca mesgetch probably would have still been there <laughs> and i mean i'm not saying he would have gotten podium seeing the course um uh, but potentially the race would have been played differently because i feel like at this point belgium probably wouldn't have chased or wouldn't have paced that much to ensure what Van would be in like the maximum of his capacity. And it would have been the likes of Alaphilippe, Hershey, Kwiatkowski to try and make these moves. But potentially we'd have more riders in the first group because the tempo was quite hard because people were chasing um, Tade Pogaza. And I think a lot of riders got uh, some heavy legs due, um, due to that. Uh, but that, that's a very valid point you're raising. Um, just before we move to uh, our well, the predictions we had. Who's the rider that disappointed you the most? If that's, if there's the rider. I mean, I think there are a few. To be honest, I, I did make a prediction about a certain British rider who didn't. I mean, it was a big ask for him, but he didn't quite do as well as I thought he could do. We mentioned Ulysses as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very disappointing. I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, the parkours were almost almost perfect for him so it was a bit bit of a shame to see him so far back um i think hagita potentially again he he would have had a chance in the sprint if he was there but of course he was nowhere near i guess of course he he abandoned the tour and uh I, apart from that maybe andrea baggioli as well yeah because That's uh it. he's shown he's shown great form on terrain like this before but uh, perhaps working more for for his teammates today it's actually very similar to Diego Ulissi. The, the, the two riders we had seen in somewhat similar shape, mm. uh, b both cracking quite early. I think more than he greeted, just Colombia as a whole was disappointing. With the team they had, they only have Uran in the top 25. Yeah, definitely. And I think th that's not something I expected, not something I think you expected either. No, definitely. I think, uh, I think Uran is. He's more suited to these longer races. He always seems to kind of take leadership for Colombia. He's done it before. I think he did it uh, two years ago where Valverde won the World Championships. But Martinez, Chavez, maybe disappointing. Lopez as well. I think Lopez struggles on, on the shorter climbs that are super steep and uh, also the longer races as well. I think Lopez is more of a Grand Tour rider than a, a one-day race with uh, 250 kilometers. He, he never seems to... To perform well in them i uh i seem to find yeah no i agree um yeah qu quite disappointed about um about colombia's performance um one rider that we had mentioned uh and we can't really talk about is alexey lutsenko because he obviously dnf'd before the start uh before the race even began uh so a big blow for uh, for kazakhstan but yeah i think uh I, I was just looking back at the entire classification i don't think there's anyone else uh that was worth mentioning um no, I think, I think we're good, uh, and we can move on to uh, the predictions we had done. Let's be honest, we, <laughs> we haven't done well. Uh, out of the six riders 
we had to finish on the podium. Um, only one rider is is there. Uh, I think wait, yeah, I think only one is uh, it's Mark Yashi. I think I'm the only one who's got someone on the podium. You are. Uh, I had Mark Yashi to win. He finished third. He showed that he was strong. Um, I think he probably could have maybe tried to follow Julian a, a bit more. Uh, and then it was quite um, quite ambitious of him to, to stay behind Wout van Aert. I mean, sure, you're not going to lead out van Aert, but you probably don't want to bring him to a sprint. Because on paper, he was by far the, the I mean, not the weakest because he finished third, but completely uh, inferior to Wout van Aert when it comes to uh, pure sprinting abilities. Uh, but yeah, he's the only rider hand on my podium. Uh, who I, oh, I've missed get, but Mez get is gone. Uh, <laughs> and who was my uh, my third rider? Oh, Michael Matthews. Michael Matthews. Yeah, I had uh, Jakob Fulsang taking the win, who of course finished in the same group as Hershey, but top five overall in fifth place. He, he I expected him to do what Alaphilippe did, essentially, uh, yeah. considering his form. He he needed to go away on that climb to have a chance. He he was never going to take it against the likes of Quieto, Hershey, and of course Van Aert in that sprint. So uh, from then on, I think his chances were done of, of winning. Um, I also had Tom Pickock in second place, and he ended 40 seconds. It's not, it's not a terrible performance. I think he finished above Mezgec. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that one as, good, as a good shot right. by me. <laughs> but, no. but no, but no, Pickock, 40 seconds, obviously joining Ineos next year. He was he was so dominant at the Baby Giro. I thought he would perhaps step up to the competition slightly better than he did. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll see. He's still 21, obviously a lot still to come from him. And then I had Michael Matthews as well. Who like you? He was close. He was close. If he if he managed to cling on, I I think he'd have won, but uh, not quite for Michael Matthews. Yeah. Uh, so I just like Luca Mezgetto did not finish the race, uh, but because you claimed that win, uh, I'm going to go back at you because I believe you had an interesting prediction for someone in the top ten or top twenty actually. I did. I did. <laughs> I had a tier Volta. In yep, the top it 20, is that correct? And uh, he finished the race, 76th position. He was by himself. I didn't I didn't actually see any of him um, throughout the race. And uh, so I, perhaps he had a few mechanicals that we didn't see that put him in some difficulty. Um, but, but yeah, of course, it was going to be difficult for him. I thought he could have been, uh, you know, in that final group, at least coming into the final climb. Uh, not to be, though. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll blame the, the TV coverage for, uh, <laughs> f- for the lack of images on Attila Valta. Uh, the second predictions we had, or the second odd one, was mine. It was Tom Schoens to finish uh, in the top 10. Um, let's not talk about this. Obviously, he didn't, right? As we know, he finished 29th ahead of Tadej Pogacar. Does that mean Tom Schoens could have won the Tour de France? Yes, <laughs> it does. 100%. That's how cycling works. Um, and I had another top 10 prediction which we are not going to discuss which regarded Belgium I mean how many did they get they got only one so you weren't you weren't too far off to be fair yeah one but I, I, said if they, I said if they get one they have Nazan in ninth they've got Van Aert in two and I don't think Nazan finished <laughs> no I think he was first to drop from their team as well yeah he, he was uh, he's actually the only Belgian that DNF'd there you go and just speaking of DNF, uh, one moment that I'll remember oddly, Marc Soler, I swear he got announced out of the race, and 50 kilometers after that, I saw him getting dropped. I don't know what happened with him or with his bike or whatsoever, but it was so weird because everyone was saying that Marc Soler um, showed he had legs on the Tour de France and gets dropped after 20 or 30 kilometers, and you just see him appear. Odd race for him. Uh, at least he got some some image time, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that was definitely another one. It was, yeah. I, I I'm not sure what to make of of Mark Soler's form, to be honest. He he was attacking a lot in the tour. He didn't really get too close to a stage win. Um, but I, I feel he's taken a, a step back almost because obviously he won Paris Nice in in 2018, I think. So a few years ago now, and he's he's got more of a leadership role now at Movistar and uh, he would have done at Spain had he been there of course um, in the final um, but yeah I- I'm not quite sure what to make of Soler's uh, recent performances yeah it- it's an odd one it's a really because it- he was seen that that 
a uh, new future Spanish Grand Tour rider, even um, praised by someone like Alberto Contador. Um, and then you had Enric Mas arriving on the scene, and I felt like Max Soler didn't enjoy that at all, because since that 2018 win on the Paris, he's been very much not there. Uh, I think he's got one GC top 10 since, I think that was on the Vuelta in 2019. Um, but it's quite curious, and with Enric Mas now in his team, uh, we'll see what, Enric, uh, what Mark Soler can do, but it's definitely um, a weird period for uh, for the 26 year old. He's already 26. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, I expected him to still be like 24, 25. But, okay. Interesting. Definitely interesting. Yeah, and I think, uh, obviously, he he was on for that stage win at the Vuelta, wasn't he? When he was dropped back by his team to help out Quintana. Maybe, yep. maybe that's just he's given up with motivation that's just uh Potentially. at least at least with this team i don't know what it is i mean it's it uh, we all know movie stars tactics on the smartest <laughs> uh but when you when you have someone like mark Soler in your team who doesn't even do the, the smartest plans it's it's definitely not something you i mean it, it's a combo that isn't match. it's not match made in heaven i think that's the saying but it definitely isn't one no I definitely agree with that i think his contract ends next season uh, at Movistar, I think, I mean, it, it depends. I think a leadership role is there for him at Grand Tour if he just shows um, his old form, really. Uh, I think he'll get a leadership at the Giro or Vuelta potentially this season. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how I he gets on. In, I could see him in a team like Bahrain or UAE. Maybe not as a leader for the, for UAE, but I, I could see him maybe working for Lambda or for Pogatar and getting, getting his own chances on, like, um, less important races like a, Vol a Volta Catalunya. No disrespect to Catalunya, <laughs> but it's not a it's not a world tour. But um, yeah, no, I I agree with uh with you here. So, uh, looking at the results, was there or even the race? Was there anyone in particular who stood out for you as a surprise surprise package that did well? I know you mentioned in the preview podcast that there's always a rider in the top ten that you know no one no one thought could be there. Uh, didn't really happen in the top 10 this year, but was there anyone else in the race that did particularly well uh, that you didn't quite see coming? Um, honestly, if we take a look at the results, not not so much. I mean, we talked about Valverde being in the top 10 at his age, which is surprising. And I mean, I can't praise it enough. Uh, maybe Valgren in 11th, doing well for Denmark. Geschke in 17th. Uh, but apart from that, there's, n there's not that shocking result that we, we often see. Um, I'll have just to, to say a few words. Uh, Tish Benu has done an incredible race. Uh, he's, he paced, he was the one ma mainly like during the, the chase behind uh, Tadej Pogacar. And then he tried to come back and help even more when he came to the final lap in Di Mazzolano and Di Cima Galisterna. Uh, I think he finishes around the 30th position. Actually, he finishes bang on 30th. There you go. Um, so, g good race from him. But no, th there's not that, uh, that result that I didn't expect. I don't know about you, but you, you, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Well, I'll mention Simon Geschke for Germany, who was there with Jackman until pretty much the final. He ended up in the top 20. And I don't know if it's as much as a surprise as it could have been a year or two ago, but Geschke's, he, he's riding pretty well now into his mid-30s. Um, so potentially Geschke, I would say. And looking at a rider slightly further down, I would say... Marcus Hulegaard of Norway, if uh, I can mm -hmm. nearly get that correct, that pronunciation. Yeah, but I, 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 I think he finished uh, 30, top 30, top 40? 36. 36, 36 yeah. Um, it, obviously, he wasn't he wasn't right there, but he's a, he's a Conti pro rider for Uno X. And I think he's in his mid-20s, certainly a rider to watch. He he had a good race. I agree, I agree. I, I completely forgot about him, but he was in, that, he was in the, the leading group uh, when the final lap uh, arrived, which is not something a lot of riders expected. Like, if, if I was to name someone from Norway to be in that group at this point, I probably would have said someone like Carl Fredrik Hagen, uh, who didn't show at all on, on the race. But yeah, uh, I will back your, your, your statement. Marcus Hulgaard finishing in, in 36th place was not something a lot of riders or a lot of people would have... Uh, been able to, uh, to to talk about and also yeah Geschke 17th uh, he's 34 he's in contract here knowing that CCC will most likely fold uh, so doing well to, uh, to show his colors I don't think he's got a new contract or he's got a uh, any contract discussions going on 
maybe a, a comeback at Sunweb. I think he, he used to write for Sunweb, or at least when it was called Giants. Um, but you could see a, a Geshka coming, well, staying in the World Tour. Still has a, a domestic, uh, but he's definitely showing that he's got the legs and he's got what it takes to, uh, well, to, to prove his place and to show that he deserves a, a spot in the World Tour. Uh, I think that about wraps it up for um, this post-race analysis of uh, the World Championships. Um, we do have a packed week ahead of us uh, for, for you lot cycling fans, uh, starting on the 29th, uh, so potentially today or tomorrow, depends on when uh, this gets out, but we'll have the Bing Bong Tour. I won't bother previewing it, because it's the Bing Bong Tour. Um, we'll then have La Flèche Wallon uh, on Wednesday, Giro on Sunday, Liège Bastogne Liège on uh, no Giro on Saturday, Liège Bastogne Liège sorry on Sunday. Uh, any guess at uh, a winner for both uh, Ardennes Classics? So the Flash obviously it's it's interesting this year with so many races on at the same time, the Giro and the Big Mac Tour colliding with uh, the Ardennes. We have a, a weakened start list somewhat compared to what we're used to seeing. So maybe we could see a surprise result, um, but. I am going to go for the flash with Dylan Toins, Dylan Toons, Dylan Toins, however oh, wow. you say it, okay. of Bahrain McLaren. He's going there with a strong team. We've mentioned Caruso. Maybe Caruso would have been a better shout. Uh, but he has Pools Lander in his team as well. But I think the Belgian, he was, he was not picked for the tour, and I think that annoys him. Um, and I think a lot of people were surprised about that. Uh, that kind of non-selection from Bahrain I think he, he could have been a great helper at the tour for Mikel Lanza and I think he'll want to uh, put some just just show himself again and uh, I think he could do that out of the flesh yeah it is yeah okay I can see that uh, I obviously would have probably gone for someone like Julien Lafilippe but uh, it turns out he is not doing the race uh, due to most likely a shellac uh, or sheer amount of alcohol in his body <laughs> which is fair enough I do understand um, the, the the decision. Um, I'm quite torn on, on the winner because the as you said the start list here is not the one you'd expect and you've got more GC leaders than actual classic guys. Uh, so you've got the likes of Tadej Pogacar, you've got Miguel Angel Lopez, you've got Richie Porte, you've got Bernal, um, you've got Uran. But I feel like I'm going to back a Polish rider, uh, Michal Kwiatkowski. He's shown on the tour that he was strong. He finished fourth of um, of the World Championships, just beyond Mark Hershey, who could have also been my pick. Uh, is Roy Vanal here? He, is, he isn't. Fudesong isn't here. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to go and say Michal Kutkowski to win uh, for La Flèche. And for Liège Bastogne, I don't think there's a, a lot of riders announced yet for the start list. Uh, so from what I can see here, I'm going to give uh, Liège Bastogne Liège to... Um, Philippe Gilbert. Philippe Gilbert. Love it. Yeah. Love it. I'll, uh, I'll go with Kwiatkowski for Liège Baston Liège, but I will say that an American rider will finish on the podium and he goes by the name of Quinn Simmons. Well, I thought you were going to say TJ Van Garder. <laughs> uh, but we can dream. We can dream. We, a man can dream, of course. I don't even think he's going to do it, no. uh, seeing his fitness on the tour. But fair enough, yeah. I, I expected uh, that, that bold pick of yours to, uh, to happen. Uh, but all right. I think that about wraps it up for this second episode of Wheel Suckers. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, then please, please do leave a like down below. I'll see if I can put this on Spotify. I have not figured out how that works, but I will one day. Don't you worry. Um, but yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. Follow Joe on all of his socials. I will link his channel, his Spotify, because there's his podcast, uh, his Twitter, Instagram, his LinkedIn, uh, and his BBM in the description. And I shall see you in the very near future. Uh, you'll have better content on my channel in the upcoming days and weeks. Expect to see uh, a certain F1 team to come back on the channel. And I shall see you in the very near future. Uh, Joe, final word? Quinn Simmons, podium at LBL. I think we're going to end up on that. Have an incredible day. My name has been Black Hole, and good bye. Pull up, pull up in the gold, I'm leading. 
All them all the man need feeding. I don't wanna go bombi. Them I don't know what I do when I go from mealing. Leading the pack in black and I'm on with the bad. Stopping with a phone and dab. Boss up a man with a duster. Put him in a drip and sip blockbuster.